and forgive me again for not having Christmas in July, but guys, here we are. The king has arrived. We are finally in chapter two of Luke. I had someone go, when are you going to get there? I don't know. We're there. We're there. We've arrived. Uh, and yes, Luke 1 is a huge first chapter. And, and the king has arrived. Now you would think we're going to have a Christmas sermon. We're not. I'm going to save that for Christmas. But what we're going to talk about today is gifts. Gifts aren't only given at Christmas. They're not only given at birthday parties. And, and there are, would you agree, special gifts? There are gifts that separate gifts from those who change, those gifts that change our lives, that make a difference in it. So we're going to talk about that today. So if you have your Bible with you, if your phone, I might post everything up online. I'm sorry, up on the screen. But we're in Luke 2. Yay. And we're going to start in verse 1 and work through 20 as, as PG so elegantly did. Thank you, honey. But I want to start with a question. And this question is this. What makes a gift special? Now, I don't mean just a gift you look forward to. Most of you are old enough, some of you are not, to remember when Atari came out. Anybody remember that? Yeah, I just had a lot of faces. Not, Julie's like, I remember that. Remember Asteroids? Space Invaders, help me out with some of your favorites. Those are the two I remember. And my dad did what everyone did. He wrapped it up and we unwrapped it and we were all excited. And he hooked it up to the TV and God, forgive me, please, dad, I know you're watching. And he played it for three hours. That's not the gift I'm talking about. If you had asked me at the age of whatever it was, seven, or eight, um, I would have said that was a special gift. That's not what I'm talking about. Talking about gifts that change lives. Gifts that, that you pause and reflect on for the rest of your life when they happen. I'll give you an example of what I mean by that. Um, I knew a man who, who gave his kidney to his brother. I know this man because I wrestled with his brother. Uh, pretty profound. His brother was going to die without a kidney. And he went on to become a great wrestler. He collegiate division one championships, the whole thing. But that's not what made the gift special. What made the gift special is that his brother, his older brother, had three kids. And he and his wife died in a car accident. His brother adopted those kids. That's a gift that changes lives. One that comes to mind is, um, and I do want to share this one because it's closer to home for all of us, but you know my daughter got married in April. It was a beautiful wedding. It was by all standards. And what she did, and I'll try not to choke up with this because I, I didn't cry at all during that wedding. <laughs> I sobbed. But my daughter, uh, in the midst of all the speeches and everything at the reception, stood up and said, my mom picked out every fork, every glass, every napkin, every tablecloth, both chandeliers, the beach house, every, every single thing, the, the rugs. She replaced the rugs in the house we rented. And she said, my mom has made this the most beautiful day of my life. What a gift this is. And she went over and gave her her bouquet of flowers. That's a gift that is special, that changes who we are. Sometimes they make us smile and sometimes they bring tears to our eyes, but they always change us. And, and I, I went out on my own. I didn't um, steal this from another pastor or a sermon. I, I, I didn't Google this. I sat down and said, there has to be a way to define what a special, a special gift is. And this is what I came up with. I have five. One, it comes at a sacrifice. Somebody gives up something, their time, their money, their energy, something. Sometimes it's a true sacrifice. It's something that we look at and say, someone has less because this person has more. That's true. I also believe it's vitally needed. My wife needed to hear that from my daughter. My daughter needed to say that. I think a kidney to your brother defines vital. It's also always given out of love. Always out of love. Always. It's, it's usually 
a love that goes both ways. But this gift has to be given out of love. It's deeply personal. It's what makes it special. If, and, and that kind of leads us to the last one. It's the one I really grip onto. It's, an, it's measurable. You would never trade it in. You would never give it up. It, would, it just means something, even if it doesn't mean anything to anybody else. That gift is yours. And it changes who we are. Now, I do want to recap a little bit. I, if, if, I, if I did miss last week, I, I, don't want to, I don't want to just drop everything we forgot in chapter 1. And while we talk, we're going to be talking about gifts today, it's important we know how we got here. Remember, this is a book written by Luke. Luke was a doctor. He was a historian. He was a man of facts. Matter of fact, my first sermon title was Just the Facts. And for anybody who ever remembers um, Dragnet, right? Dragnet. Joe Friday said, Just the Facts. Well, that's what Luke is doing. Because his audience is a fact-driven part of society. They are looking for physio- 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 physiologically, physically and philosophically the perfect man, the Greeks. And, and, and Luke stands up and says, I want to show you who that is. So instead of starting with the birth of Christ, he goes all the way back and he includes Zachariah and Elizabeth in the story we talked about there. And all the things that came along with that, these two impossible people do the impossible for God. That, of course, leads to John the Baptist, being that he, they were his parents. And, and we get this angelic experience from Gabriel, one of which is talking to Zachariah about who John will be, how important he is. And then the other message from Gabriel, wow, is to Mary, this 13, 14-year-old girl who's going to change everything we know. We experienced the songs of praise from both Mary and Zachariah talking about, and we, we discussed and preached, I preached on, and I hope you took from that, is how do we react when God calls us? Do we do what Mary did with open hands or, or when Zachariah tripped and fell a little bit, how he recovered? This is all in chapter one, and Luke is building this all up so that we get to Mary and Joseph. Why? Because it's just the facts. The people he'll be talking to are going to do what we do, especially if you're a new Christian. You're going to go prove it. Prove it. I need to know this is true. When, why, how. I need to know it, and I need to know the facts. So Luke steps right into, builds right up, and then steps right into the story, the narrative that we saw today. And now what we're going to do with this narrative, instead of just going through the Christmas story, which we will later on in the year, is we're going to talk about the four gifts that I think that God is offering to us here, that he displays and shows us here. The four gifts are simple. The gift of prophecy fulfilled, not just prophecy, prophecy fulfilled. We'll see that through the first five verses. The gift of humility. We'll experience that in verse six and seven. The gift of joy, we'll see in eight and 14. And the one The one I hang on to probably more tightly than anything else is the gift of hope found in 15 through 20. And before we dig into the verse, which we're, the verses we're about to, I I want you to think about these things in today's light. Yes, this happened a couple thousand years ago. Yes, it is. uh, the, the, The ultimate gift without a doubt is the son of God, our savior. No questions asked, but it wasn't the only gift he gave us. There was so much more. And something like joy and hope, humility. Don't you think we need more of that in the world today? When we look out these windows, isn't that what's lacking? But it's a gift that's given to us. So I, wanna, I want you to keep that in mind, that this special gift, I hope to show you that it is just that, a special gift. So let's, let's take a look at the first uh, point I want to make, and that's the gift of prophecy. I'm not going to go through all in detail, um, the, the reading again, but we see that Caesar Augustus and, 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 and Luke goes out of his way to, to, to tell us who is in charge here. What is happening? Who is going on? What's going on? Where it is? What point are we in history? He does that on purpose. He does that on purpose because when he talks about Caesar Augustus without doing a huge history lesson, he's the son of Julius Caesar. He is a, the power of Rome. 
He considers himself a god. By all standards, if you ask anybody outside the Christian world, who is the most important person in the world? It's this guy. And Luke recognizes that, and he knows that his readers will as well. The people who are going to hear this letter would get that. And he goes on, and he talks about this registration. And why is that important? It's a census, per se. We do census. Why do we do it? For the same reason they did it. We try to discover where the money, or try to discover, we try to plan where the money will go. In this case, he needs money. He needs revenue. He needs taxes. So, by decree, only one person in the world at this time could go, you all go. And they would go. So God orchestrates this where the most powerful man by the hand of God sets up what must be fulfilled. And how does he do this? He says, uh, Joseph also went up from Galilee. Where? He went to the, from the town of Nazareth to Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. Now, if I said, do you, anybody who has ever even witnessed the Christmas story, we all know where Bethlehem is. Well, we might not know where exactly it is, but we all know of Bethlehem, right? This was a nothing town. We understood when we talked about Nazareth, right? If anything, it was a nothing town. If it would be a zero town, if it wasn't for the garrison, the, the thousands of Roman soldiers that were there, Bethlehem, other than the historical prophecies that God gave us, is just a little town. It's a nothing. It is the city of David, and that's about the only thing that gives it credence. But what's important here, and why Luke points this out, is that these are the things, in many different aspects of the Old Testament, have been prophesied hundreds, not thousands of years earlier, that this son my son, my savior, would be born in this town by a virgin. He goes on, he says, um, because he was from the house of the lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. Mary is about eight months pregnant, at least. I know there are some people who have children here. Um, an important fact to understand here, is Mary did not have to take this trek. She didn't have to take this journey. It was not, it, not my words, but women were not important when it came to being identified in this culture. And Mary being a child, no less, was even less important. And I'm gonna go out on a limb here because I remember when PJ was pregnant with Mackenzie. I know if I looked at her and said, hey, honey, um, jump on the donkey, and you're going to walk some of it. Uh, we're going to take a pretty long trek uh, because Israel is one of three things, it, well, four things. It's either really dry, really wet, really hot, or really cold. That, that's it. Those are your options. And PJ, you get to pick what season we go in. But we're going to go trekking. I know you're eight and a half months pregnant, um, but I need you to you know, suck it up, buttercup. Let's go. And we're going to make this trip. Oh, do you have to go? No, but I just want you to come with me. All the way to this little town of Bethlehem. Now, there's some important things here we need to point out. She's, Mary is betrothed. But she is not married. This is going to be a, a, a difficult situation at best. Joseph, we get in the other Gospels of how this moment has been orchestrated and how he faithfully stayed with her. We'll save that for the Christmas season. But God has made this all happen in such a way that no one can question his fulfillment of scriptures. And what do we take away from this? What do we take away from this? One, God always keeps his promises. You've heard me say this throughout Luke. You've heard me say this throughout any preaching I do. God always, always, always keeps his promise. And what does that mean to you? As we read this, you can go, well, God keeps his promise. But what does that mean to you specifically? Should you have a different confidence? Should you walk a different way? Should you be bold to a different standard than those who don't know Christ? You should. You should. And your life should reflect that. Also, God is in control of history. Let's, let's talk about this. The odds of getting someone like a, a, a Caesar Augustus 
promised Mary Joseph all to a city in Bethlehem, as promised, and we're going to look at some scripture we have already that foretells of this happening, that make this all absolutely happen exactly at the right time in the right place, because God, you've all heard it. Is he ever late? Nope. Is he ever early? Nope. He's right on time every time. It's God's plan, God's will, and God's time, always. And God is in control of history. What parts of history? Your history? Yes. This history? Absolutely. And he orchestrates it as such that we should embrace the fact that he's got his fingerprint on our lives. And then the last thing that I want you to take from this opening verse, other than just the Christmas story, but this gift opens up the fact that we should know, we should have confidence in, is that nothing is impossible for God. Let me say that again. Nothing is impossible for God. This might have surprised Mary. It might have surprised the other players in this. Certainly surprised the shepherds we'll talk about. But God's not surprised. This is exactly what he had planned for this moment before time began. Matter of fact, if we go back even to Micah, we see that he announces that, oh, Bethlehem, he says, but you, O Bethlehem, Ephrath, Eph I can't say it today, Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clan of Judah. You're nobodies. But listen to this. This is hundreds and hundreds of years before. For you shall come forth for me, who is to be ruler in Israel. I'll admit that I struggle with trusting God all the time. I kind of want my fingerprint on my life. I do. I kind of want to you know, give my opinion. You write the, the, the story of my life. You don't mind if I edit a little, just a little bit. Just a little bit. See, God doesn't do any of that. God says, this is what I'm going to do, and I'm going to tell you about it. And we're blessed to have fulfilled scripture for no other reason except we gain confidence in the Lord who is always, always right. That wasn't the only gift we have. The gift of humility. And you think, Pastor Sean, I, I, I don't see that. I mean, how is humility a gift? I don't even like being humble. None of us do. It's hard to be humble, isn't it? It's hard. No matter, and then we have some people in this church that, oh, they are good at it. They are really, they're humble. You look at the outside. But if you're honest, is it our nature to be humble? Is it? I, I, I don't think so. Do we like humble people? We do. We love them. We watch them and go, I like them. What about people who aren't humbled? What about people who are arrogant, cocky? We don't like that. That's not what we want. It's uncomfortable to be around them. And what God gives us here, he demonstrates this amazing gift of humility. And he unwraps it for us and he gives it to us. He says, and while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. Let me stop there for a minute. Let me read the next verse and I'll add it in. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothing and laid him in a manger. There's so much we miss here. Young women did not give birth to their children by themselves. It was expected, it was understood that there would be a group of people that would help them through this birthing process. Mary's alone. She's alone. Why are they not in the inn that we keep hearing about and we'll study? Why are they not there? It's because she's pregnant. Jewish hospitality, without going back through all of it, is very simple. If someone's in need, you provide it. If they need a place to stay, you offer it. If they're hungry, you feed them. And what's the penalty if you don't? Well, you get scolded. Nuh uh. It's serious with God. To be hospital, hospitable is. Do not be hospitable is a sin. And yet we have this young woman giving birth by herself. I can't imagine what Joseph was like. I mean, I'm sure he was pretty cool after the visit from Gabriel. Nah. The one thing I am very great, I, I baptized my daughter and I married her. The one thing I'm very happy I didn't do is give her birth. Yeah, I'm glad I wasn't the one responsible for that. It's a serious, and I know we have nurses. We have people in the medical field here. You don't mess with that. That is a serious, serious thing. And this 13 to 14-year-old, 
is by herself. And then he's wrapped in these clothes. We call them swaddling clothes. If we go back and we look at that, it basically meant scraps. It's what we could, what we could find and bring with us. And they laid him in a manger. I really wish they would translate this differently. I really would. Most of you have heard this. It was not the pretty scene that we will probably do out here or other churches do. Don't get me wrong. I think it's beautiful to to recognize the birth of Christ. But it was not a straw-filled little wooden rocker with angelic lights and nice clean animals. The Son of God was put in a feeding trough. I would believe that Mary did the best she could to clean it out. But if anybody's ever worked with farm animals, any animals at all, you don't ever clean that out. She takes this child. God. And puts him in what is probably just a carved out bowl shaped indent in stone. Let me stop for a second here. Yes, we could talk about why they weren't in the inn and all that good stuff. I, I, that doesn't give the gift the specialness. Here's what gives the gift. It's what makes it special. God the, of everything, of heaven and earth, In the presence of God, somewhere along the line, his son stepped forward and said, I will go. What does that mean? We all hear it. We see it all the time. We're like, well, God stepped down from heaven. He stepped down from heaven in the presence of God. He didn't come as a man. He could have easily come as a full-grown man, armored up, ready to be king. He's in a trough. It doesn't get more humble than this. The king of kings comes, no palace, no announcements. It was often done when a child was born that they would hire even musicians if there weren't family members who would announce and sing. In a hole in the wall, God comes. That's humility. And it's something we very, oh, it should move you. If tears don't come to your eyes at Christmas, if you don't understand what God sacrificed to be here long before the cross, you don't get Christmas. This is not just a gift. It is a powerful, special gift. So what do we take from this? What do we take from this and apply to our lives? One, God is selfless. How is the God of everything selfless? If he said, I want all of you to come to a knee, I want all of you to do exactly what I say, I get everything, we would all go, yeah, you're God. That's what he does. God comes to us. God gives of himself. And God, thank God for this, God is focused on the eternal. When that child in the trough came, he did not come to fix the Roman problem that the Jews were hoping for. It was not even to fix what necessarily happened in Eden. It was not just to see. It was not for here and now. It did fix here and now. It did open up the door for salvation. But without that door open, there's no such thing as eternity for us. You, me, we don't even deserve to be forgiven, yet alone spend the rest of our eternity with the God of gods. And yet, by this act, by his action alone, we witness that. And the big thing here, too, and this is something I want you to think about for yourselves, is God embraces humility. He calls us to be humble. Someone asked me the other day, what does it mean to be made in God's image? Does that mean if he has blue eyes, we have blue eyes? If he has long hair, we have long hair? Obviously, with the many different kinds of people we have here, it it doesn't mean a physical thing. 
what I do think it means is his character. And one of those things is humility. You really want someone to know that you love them, that you care about them, that, you, that they're special to you? Be humble. Be humble. I know a, a friend of mine who, um, when I was in seminary, we had a, uh, a, another friend of ours who's, um, whose wife, uh, grandmother died. And uh, I don't know if you know this about seminary students, but we're not rich. We're just not. Most college students are seminaries for some reason. We, you know, we, we really are poor. And uh, I remember having a conversation with this person afterwards. Um, they went and came back, and, and uh, someone had bought them a plane ticket so their whole family could go. This person's well off, does really well. You never would know it if you met them. You never would. But this person, this person, this friend who, who took his wife out to say goodbye to her grandmother said, it's such a great display of humility that someone would help us like that. When we had Gary here, his friend died. You all paid for an airline ticket for him to go to that funeral. That's humility. And it's, in my opinion, no greater demonstration of the reflection of God's love for us than when it's done in humility. Would you agree? I hope so. I think Paul does, because when he wrote in 2 Corinthians to illustrate this, this fact that he writes this, for you know the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, and that's an understatement, yet for your sake he became poor so that you by his poverty, might become rich. I, this is a whole other sermon, and I will definitely come back to this someday. But you have to understand how rich he was and how much he gave up so that the poverty that he experienced would be your, your riches. Let's talk about the third gift, joy. Um, Luke goes on and he writes, he says, in the same region there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And, 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 and it talks about how the angels showed up and then the glory of the Lord shone around them. Now, let's pause here for a minute because if you're me, you're going, why is this even here? I mean, Christ is born. Why include shepherds? Why, 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 why not kings? Why not majesty? Why are all the important people, well, Augustus, why are these people all not coming? Well, why shepherds? You have to understand that there's a pecking order like there is in every society. And, and you had the rich and the Pharisees and the religious leaders and the wealthy. And as you move your way down, uh, you, you would see poor laborers and, and then right above leopards are shepherds. I'm, I'm, I'm not exaggerating. They weren't just nobody. They were nobodies. There was no value to them other than what they would do. They did a job that no one else did. They were religiously completely unclean all the time. They slept, as I said, they were either hot, they were cold, they were wet, or they were burning up dry. This wasn't... Three Shetlin, Shetlin, um, uh, what were they? Healers. Let's, I have healers. It's easy to remember. It wasn't three healer dogs and someone blowing a whistle and running sheep all over the place. This was out in the wilderness. Lions, tigers, and bears. Certainly bears, certainly lions, and wolves. These men protected these animals. And let's face it. Sheep are not the most cooperative, smartest people in the world. I'm sorry, I slipped on that. Sheep are not the most cooperative. <laughs> I really did slip on that. Uh, <laughs> uh, cooperative and understanding and smart animals in the world. And yet they protected them. And out of nowhere. It's not just the angels. Don't miss this. The Lord shone around them. The glory of the Lord came down to announce the birth of his son. To who? Imagine what they said. Did you, did you get uh, Herod's over there? Rome is up there. Why us? It's because the gift of joy is not important to the rich or to the poor. It's important to all of us. 
I know people who have a lot of money. I know people who have zero money. And we all want joy in our lives. And you know what? We've talked about this. Joy does not mean happiness. Happiness comes and happiness goes. Sometimes in seconds. Joy is that understanding that we find in God contentment and peace that lives in us all the time, regardless if we're an apostle in a dungeon, whether we're a savior, the, the savior's mother sitting in a dugout hole, a manger. Regardless of circumstances, joy comes to all of us, including the shepherds. Now, look what they say. And they were filled with great fear. Duh. I mean, yeah. I always always love when people go, I really would love to see the face of God. If I believed in God, if he could just show them. You don't want that. I I, I promise you, you don't want that. It changes. it, It does more than change you. But these men are in the witness of the God. And the angel said for him, fear not. Behold, I bring you good news of what? Great joy. Just joy? No, no. Great joy. That will be for who? All people. Not King Herod. Not Rome. Not those who can afford it. For all people. Imagine being the shepherd at this time. I, we don't know how many there were. There, there probably was at least three by all the research I did. At least three, probably five. Imagine what they felt. They would even go into town. They weren't welcome. There was no way they could do anything and be recognized of any worth. They were a step above a leopard. And here it is. The angels of the Lord comes to him, them, and says, you're important. He goes on. It says, for on to you. And they could have just said, hey, look, if, I, if angels show up to me and go, go there. I'm like, yep. <laughs> you don't have to go into detail. But they do. And they do it for purpose. For on to you is born this day in the city of David, a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. Now, you have to remember, most of these guys are probably Jewish. If not, they're surrounded, certainly in Bethlehem, by the Jewish faith. They have been waiting for this day, who? Everyone, for thousands of years. They have been begging for this Messiah to come. And you know what happens in time? Have you ever asked someone to do something for you and they do it right away and you go, that's cool. And you're happy. Have you ever asked someone to do something and they drag their feet? And then two, three months later, it's still not done. You kind of hint it every now and then and it's still not done. What do you do? You just kind of God give up on him. Many of these people have been waiting for the voice of God. We know that the voice of God has not been heard for over 400 years up to this point, more than that. And now, before these impossibles, these nobodies, angels, angels, not just a, a memo, angels are declaring that this Messiah has come. Wow. And they don't stop there. They say, this will be the sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in uh, swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly the angels of the multitudes and heavenly hosts praise God saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth among those, and peace on earth among those whom he is pleased. God doesn't do average. I've heard, I've seen many commentaries on this. Um, talking about legions of angels. What I do know is this. If you were alive in that period of time and anywhere near this continent, you are very aware of what was going on above these heads of these shepherds. God was announcing to the world this magic gift. And then he goes on. um, We'll see here in a second. He goes on, but before we We see what the shepherds did. Let's take from this what God tells us. One is God is joy. He is a God of joy. He wants you to feel joy. He wants you to have that assurance in him. He's also the source of joy. Why do I bring that up? I know in my own personal life, I've looked for joy in different places, in empty wells. And the worst part is they're not always empty. 
but it only filled a certain amount. And it gets me stuck there. And I see drinking and hoping and trying. This must be, this will give me joy. And then it runs out. Or it's completely dried out. Isn't that how we, not all of us maybe, but certainly me, but isn't that how the world kind of looks at it? We look for joy in all the wrong places. And there's only one source for it. There's only one source that gives you that lasting joy. Because if it's not lasting, is it even joy? See, joy is lasting. We lean on it all the time. Regardless of our circumstances, yes, it's intentional. But God is that source. And one, and beyond that, God, God loves the hopeless. Does he want everyone to experience his joy? Sure. But he makes it very clear, clear that if you're rich, that you have a lot, and you don't lean on God, do you go to seek God for joy? It's hard. It's hard to do that. But do you think these shepherds, they expected nothing. <laughs> they weren't even angry anymore. They were just like, we're nobodies. And all of a sudden, this gift is unwrapped for them. How do you think they felt? to experience the hope of God, the joy of God. And the last thing I see from here, and, and this is just my opinion, is God doesn't do good. He doesn't. God's standard is well above good. It's well above great. God doesn't do things halfway. He lights the skies up with angels to announce the coming of this child. He goes to the people who really, really, really matter. Those he would come to save. Christ told us very carefully when asked, why, 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 why do you hang out with them? Why the prostitutes? Why the whores? Why the tax collectors? His answer is, they need me. They need me. The rich, they just walk away. These men are a great example if you're sitting here today and you're thinking, I know I look good on the outside, but I am so empty on the inside. God isn't going to lift you up to the level of good. That's not his intention. God doesn't do just good. He wants abundance for you in your life. And I am not saying, please write a blank check and send it in and God will tend. No, no, no. that has nothing to do with it. And if anybody ever tells you that, shame on them. What I am saying is this, this, God wants you to know his love. He wants you to find peace in that. And we call that joy. And last point, I'm sorry, before I go on to the last point, is that Paul does a great job illustrating this. Let, 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 me, let me put it forward about joy. May the, may the, he tells us in Romans 15, 13, may the God of hope fill you with what? All the money? All the riches, all the respects. No. May God fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by his power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. And that's a good lead into our last um, point for the day, the gift of hope. Um, when I wrote this, I paused. Um, have you ever been in a position where you desperately needed hope? When you just put your hands up and say, I, I don't know where to go from here. What do I do? I can't even visualize tomorrow. Perhaps it was a message you got, something about your health or, or a, a loss of a job, maybe whatever it was. It brought you to your knees. And that's what God gives us beyond just the Savior, beyond joy. He gives us hope. See, when the angels went away, Luke writes, the shepherds said to one another, let us go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste. I will, I don't question most uh, translations often. That, that just doesn't do it justice. They didn't just jog. They didn't strap up, start moving in that direction. They took off. They ran. What about all the sheep in there? That's secondary. We're going to leave that behind. And we're going, and we're going to go to see this. And, and why, why the gift of hope? As they went, 
with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. Can you imagine how that looked? Running, <sighs> coming and stopping. And there, yeah, you told me there was a baby, but look right there. And I got a feeling, and I, it doesn't say this, please don't hold this against me, but I've got a feeling that Joseph and Mary were not surprised that who showed up. They weren't much different than the shepherds. They were not much higher on the society ladder. And when they saw it, they made known, get this, I love this. And when they saw it, they made known to the saying that had been told to them concerning this child. And all who heard and wondered at what the shepherds told them. How do I know that everyone saw this light, this sh amazing sound of the proclamation of God? It's because now people are up. The shepherds are speaking to people. That alone is astounding. But they're listening, and when they say, well, they heard it and they wondered, they were astounded. They were so surprised. And then only like God can, he stops. If, if this was a movie, the, the music now would change. And it would be all excitement. You know, I think, I don't know why I thought this. Remember the, you probably do, Star Wars in the end when they win? The first one, the original one. And they come back and they beat the, and the music's going loud and everything. And, and then we get a little side story. And the tone changes and the music changes. We all seen movies like that. This is one of those moments. People are in wonder. The shepherds are astounded. I, I imagine at this point, if, if Joseph is a good husband, which I'm pretty sure he is, he's trying to figure out how to feed them. Oh, we, we, we need to get something. I mean, he's doing husband stuff, you know, basically walking around, not doing anything right, and trying to figure out how to do it better. And Mary just kind of kind of steps back, goes to a corner. And Luke tells us, and we know this to be true, because Luke interviewed Mary. How does that question go? Mary, what was it like to hold the child who is the son of God? I imagine she said something like, I can't explain it. But this is what Luke said, she said. And Mary treasured all these things, pondering them in her heart. For those of you who have had children, how do you describe holding that child for the first time? If I said, describe it to me, you, you would go, <sighs> I know because I held my daughter for the first time. I can't describe it to you. I certainly am not going to talk about it any more than I am now. You already saw me sob at her wedding. I don't need to do it here. But imagine what Mary was like. And, 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 and then they close it up and they say, the shepherds return, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen and how they and, 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 <coughs> and it had been told to them. Here are the first evangelists. Who does God go to? Does he go to the big wigs? Does he go to the public speakers to go, tell the world about my son? No. He goes to the impossibles. The ones that if you and I wrote the script, we wouldn't even include them in the side notes. Here are your first evangelists. Here are the ones proclaiming God. What do you think their lives were like after that? Do you think anybody ever called them a nobody again? And if they did, do you think they cared? Gifts, special gifts, change lives. Now I want to close up with this last thought on this last gift. One, God is the only source of hope. Is that a fact? It is, but you need to know that. If you really need hope, I, 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 would, I would give whatever I could to help you in your circumstances. I would. My wife would. All of you would. But there are certain times when the only thing that can fix, get you through, is hope. And God tells us, you wouldn't have designed it this way, but I'm going to give you hope. 
Also keep in mind, he never forsakes his children. He doesn't. If you are a child of God, he does not turn away from you, ever. So much so that he turned away from his son so that he could keep his eyes on you. That's love. And in that, we can find hope. And then lastly, God wants us to have hope in him. This is why he gave us these gifts. This is why he, he unwrapped these things for us. It wasn't so that we could put them in the closet. Because I, I don't know, I said the Atari. Same, but if, if you do, you don't want it anymore. Just give it to me. I'll, 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 I'll find a place for you. Don't, don't, in the back of the, especially if it's unwrapped in a box somewhere. Don't, I mean, does anybody still have the Atari? No. What seemed great for a moment is now gone. And yet, God says, I don't want that to be the case with you. We'll finish up here. Peter, Second Peter, um, does a better job of illustrating this than anything I could find out in our world today. And Peter writes, but in your hearts, honor Christ, the Lord as holy, always being prepared for what? To make a defense. For what reason? To anyone who asks, for what reason? To show the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. There's an old saying, tell everybody about Christ. Everyone. Everyone you know, you should tell them about Christ. And if you must, use words. You don't have to explain hope. And God doesn't want you to. He just wants you to have it. So, um... I got a quote from Chuck Swindoll. I got to grab something here to summarize. And, 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 and I think Chuck Swindoll did a really good job with this. Uh, he, des- he describes this whole summary, if you will. He summarizes it for me. On a rescue mission designed by his father, began uh, before time began, Jesus silently slipped into our world, breathed our air, felt our pain, became acquainted with our sorrows, suffered and died for our sins to show us If I've lost you, come back. I need you to take this home with you. To show us what? The way out of darkness and into this glorious light. I have a question for you. I know you know from what we've talked about that that God wants to be in control. He he is in control. We know he, he handles every aspect of our life. He is the creator of joy. He's the creator of hope. But I want to ask you the same question I asked you at the beginning. What makes a special gift? Is it a sacrifice? Yes. Is it vitally needed? Sure. Is it given out of love? Wow. Come on. Is it deeply personal? He's the son of God. It doesn't get more personal than that. Is its value measurable? I don't know about you, but in my life... I wouldn't give it away for a billion dollars and a promise of eternal bliss. I will suffer in the trenches with my God because he is my God. But I left something off here. Yes, a gift, a special gift needs to be all these things. But there is one thing that it absolutely will be. And all these things are irrelevant irrelevant without this. A gift must be received. You can do anything you want. You can do anything to make something special for someone, but if they go, no. No, I I, I won't accept it. It's too much. It's lost. Have you received this gift? Have you? I know it was given to you. You know it was given to you. We've had a thousand years to unwrap this. But are you like Mary? Yes. Do you deserve it? No. You know that. But have you unwrapped it? Or is it in the back of a closet somewhere? I hope you have. 
That's really what Christmas is about. Yes, it's about our Savior and God stepping onto this earth, but it's, it's foundationally this. God loves you that he gave the most important gift he could to you. Will you receive it? I hope so. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. We, we thank you for Christmas. Um, we can't even comprehend God. We confess that what this moment was like. I mean, I mean, we can visualize it. We can try to reenact it. But what you've done in this, what you did in that moment, what you gave up to be in that moment, the people that you involved in this, Oh, God, we thank you for being the greatest conductor of the most amazing orchestration well, that we could even fathom. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for his gift, his sacrifice, and long, long before the cross, he demonstrated humility that we should mimic, that we should share and demonstrate to others. Thank you for hope and thank you for joy. And thank you for being a God who always, always keeps his promises. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.